Alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah Amma ba'd Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu Brothers and sisters Welcome to another episode of Chai with my Bai Today again we're joined by the usual panel Saad, Shraiz and Imran Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu Assalamu alaikum Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu and today's topic is a very serious topic, hence we've banned the tea mugs, we've banned the tea, we've banned the timer, uh, we've even banned the cameraman. Um, <laughs> <laughs> That's why you're going to see him, like, waving his hand around, because we're actually uh, manually from the remote control. The cameraman. <laughs> so today's topic is, um, for some reason, recently there's been a huge influx of people emailing us, messaging us, commenting, Every day. DMing on the issue of free mixing. Mm. What is free mixing? What is the correct segregation in Islam? Um, you know, according to the Quran, according to the Sunnah, there's a lot of confusion, a lot of doubts being put out there by people. Um, so people have been asked to address this issue. And rather, in fact, we were planning, we, we already recorded one last week, um, Chai Mabai, on the topic of exams and Ramadan. In terms of fasting, you've got exams, long hours, is there an excuse for you? What, what, what should you do? What can you do? What can't you do? Um, and that was supposed to be out today. But we've decided to do this one instead because of the immediate need at hand. So as always, you know, before we get into it, we try and lay a foundation uh, to make it as easy as possible for you guys to understand where we're coming from, why Islam says this, you know, and build on from there. Um, so I'll pass it straight over to Imran. So if you could, inshallah, lay that foundation for us, explain no. to us the reasons why free mixing is haram and the no. wisdoms behind that. Sure. Alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah wa ala That's a, a very good question. And the reason why it's important that we understand the foundation for why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prohibited free mixing in the first place is because it will help you to give some context when you know what's at stake if you don't, you know, prevent free mixing. Well, actually, you find that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he prohibits something in the sharia, he prohibits it to protect at least one of five things. Okay, so okay. anything that Allah made haram in the Sharia, anything that He made haram in the sh- His Sharia, comes back to this comes one. back to protecting these five. Okay, okay, one or more. Okay. What are the five things that Allah wants to protect? Number one is your religion. Anything that gets in the way of harming your religion or becomes a threat to your religion and your iman, the Sharia made that haram. Okay. That's one of the reasons why imitating the kuffar is not permissible Because if you imitate them externally Remember the external has an effect on the internal Do you see what I'm saying? You don't imitate someone you hate You imitate someone you love So you start to love the kuffar And then you start to love the kuffar that they do So that's one of the reasons why that became haram right? Another thing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to protect Is your life So anything that could be a threat to your life To your blood right? Smoking etc Whatever have you yeah, Or, or uh, anyone's blood That became now haram Also anything that becomes a threat to your sanity that's okay. why alcohol is haram, mm-hmm. right? And even the kuffar will not disagree that sanity is something that needs to be protected, right? Mm-hmm. So when you make them understand sanity needs to be protected, then you tell them, oh, okay, so that's why Islam drugs said and alcohol and, and drugs and all these things are haram because they, they damage your sanity, right? And then there's your wealth. Anything that could harm your wealth. Riba harms your wealth, right? Inshallah, we'll discuss that one day. That's why it became haram. The fifth and final thing, and that's, that's why student loans are haram. Student loans are haram, exactly. The fifth and final thing that Sharia came to protect is your honor. Is your honor okay? And anything that gets in the way of your honor, the Sharia came to to stop that. And free mixing directly damages and attacks the honor of the people. For example, fornication is that not stripping away someone's honor, Akhi? Right? That you take this woman who's not halal for you and you take her virginity and you do with her, and she's someone's daughter, she's someone's mum, she's someone's sister, she's you know, could be someone's wife because people are adulterers nowadays. So, zina. Is at all time high nowadays 80.7 I think it was 2014 If you go to high schools Yeah 87.5% of them Are fornicating We're talking about 16 year old kids Akhi. By the age of 16 87.5% of them Are fornicating and Nowadays even younger you see I, I remember nine, when I was eight, in school Year 8 The kids were having intimacy A'udhu Billah And fornicating In the disabled toilets That's how peak it was Okay So that's one That's one way It damages your honour Okay Free mixing direct. What's another way It breaks down marriages it causes divorce to happen. A man is outside, he's looking at other women, he comes back home, he says to his wife, babe, I don't like you no more. I like this other girl that I've been free mixing with. It allows him to look around and be tempted by others. And the woman might do the same. She might be like, husband, listen, I'm free mixing with this guy in my eye soccer. I'm free mixing with this guy, you know, in this da'wa, you know, event or whatever it is that I'm doing. I like him. I don't like, you know, it, it opens the door for them things to happen. Even worse than that sometimes is when they won't even tell you, you won't even say it, but in their heart, yeah. Now they're, they're like, hmm, someone else. Oh, they, they, they're cheating. 
They're doing zina. They 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 adulterers. You see what I'm saying? Another way that it harms you is that it prevents for you know uh, good work. Like you know, even Ofsted, they they did a survey on schools that perform better, segregated schools or mixed schools, and they found segregated schools perform better. Why? Because in the mixed schools, the girls are too busy, like you know, making sure their makeup and everything's all right, and the guys are just out there trying to impress the girls. No one's focusing on work, and the same thing will happen in the workplace. If that happens at school, it will happen in the workplace as well. Again, that's generally speaking, generally obviously speaking. there are individuals within these schools and what what that. Put the head down. Shout out to you guys, but we're just speaking yeah. generally. Also, it increases sexual harassment. Okay, he speak to women. Well, like it's sad. Uh, on like every woman is sad. There's not a woman you'll find that hasn't been sexually harassed, either verbally or physically, of some way. Do you see what I'm saying? And free mixing it leads to that. Another thing that free mixing leads to is diseases for which there is no cure. Okay, I'm getting STIs. sisters emailing me. I've got STDs, bro. I'm looking. I, I, I'm looking to get married, but I've got STDs. I'm gonna pass it on to my husband. What do I do? Like, do you see what I'm saying? Okay, serious, these serious, are all serious. things that came as a result of free mixing, which the Sharia came to protect because they wanted to protect your honor. And then one that I mention, inshallah ta'ala, finally, even though there's many more, and we can go deeper and deeper and deeper into this issue, but many more, okay, but what one mentioned is that free mixing destroys governments, it destroys Islamic nations. If you look back at Islamic Spain, okay, if you look at the history books, yeah, Andalus, how was it that the, that the Christians managed to conquer? Is when the Muslims fell into fornication. They actually sent in dancing girls and alcohol when the Muslims got sucked in and then they fell. And this is why Imam Ibn Qayyim, and we'll refer back to the statement later because the statement plays a central role in terms of the discussion that we're having today. But he said in his book, Turuq al that free mixing doesn't enter into a nation except that that nation now becomes destroyed. Okay. You see? So we're talking, his scholars brought this issue of free mixing into books of government. Turuq al is a book on Islamic governance. Politics, Islamic politics, yeah, which is not the politics that people think today, voting for uh, Theresa May and whatnot, which we'll be addressing soon, because voting is not permissible, we'll talk about soon, but proper Islamic politics, you know, uh, and they bring it into those books, issue of free mixing, to show you how serious it is, so that's the foundation, now you understand what's at stake, that's why the Sharia came to prohibit it, and it came to prohibit it from any possible angle it could possibly prohibit it from. Okay, so so far, okay, the foundation in laid. We understand why free mixing, if it's impermissible, why it's impermissible. But the question now is, is that you know not seeing what evidence was brought. Not that that's a bad thing because in that situation you weren't trying to yeah prove that it's haram. You were just stating the reason, the wisdom behind why it is haram. So does anyone want to come in now with any of the evidences? from the Qur'an or from the Sunnah according to the understanding of the scholars as to why free mixing, sorry, as to whether or not free mixing is haram. Okay, so um, we know that free mixing it occurs when a boy and a girl who are not nahran, they're you know, intermingling with each other and whatnot. So I want to bring to your attention an ayah in the Qur'an in Surah Al-Ahzab where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, talks to the women. And he says, وَقَرْنَا فِي بُيُوتِ كُنَّا وَلَا تَبَرَّجَنَا تَبَرُّجِ الْجَاهِلِيَّةِ الْأُولَى So, what does this mean? It means, and <coughs> stay in your houses. Yeah? So, talking to the women. Stay in your houses. And do not display yourselves like that of the time of Jahiliyyah. Now, Mujahid, the student of Ibn Abbas, radiallahu an, when he explained what this meant, he said that, you know, the women at the time of Jahiliyyah, they used to go outside of their houses and mix with the men. Okay. And this ayah came to prevent that. Now, I'm not going to take my understanding from this. We're not going to take, you know, our understanding from this. We're going to take the understanding of I'm sorry, Akhi, yeah? you have to explain, firstly, you have to explain to who Mujahid is, because you just yeah. said something powerful. Mujahid rahimahullah was the greatest student of Abdullah ibn Abbas. Imam of Tafsir. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And Abdullah ibn Abbas was who? He was the most knowledgeable companion when it came to the Quran. Quran the Prophet made dua for him, say, Allah teach him the interpretation which is of the Quran, right? And Mujahid said, I open the Mus'haf, I open the Quran, this on Abdullah ibn Abbas three times. And every time I stop, say, what does this mean? Three times. Like, what does I mean? What does I mean? What does I mean? And that's why the Salaf used to say, if what Mujahid says comes to you, Fahasbuk. So if you say, if the tafsir of Mujahid, if Mujahid explained an ayah, Fahasbuk stops up. You don't need nothing else. Mm. Because Mujahid got from Ibn Abbas, and Ibn Abbas was the most knowledgeable Sahabi when he was alive at the time when he came to the Quran. He was the cousin of the Prophet. He was the cousin of the Prophet. Yeah. So, so. so we're not going to take our understanding. Rather, I'm going to bring you another scholar, Ibn Kathir. Now, we all know who Ibn Kathir is. Imam of Tafsir, right? 
And what did Ibn Kathir say when it came to commenting on this ayah in Surah Al-Ahzab, ayah 33? He said, for the women to cling to their houses and not come out except that it be of a need, except that they need to fulfill a need and whatnot. So we're going to touch on now what is a need, because we know that the women's, the asal of a woman is that, that she should remain in her house. Based on this ayah. Based on this ayah, except... If there is, a, there need. is a need that she needs to no. fulfill. No. Now, I don't know who wants to comment, but inshallah, yeah, just very quickly, what is uh, what, you know, a need? Okay, so this is actually a side point, but the reason I'm mentioning it is because we don't want sisters to be like, oh, like yeah, is yeah, my house yeah. a prison for me now? Yeah. No, so it, the asr, like I said, is to stay, but you can come out for going to the masjid, as the Prophet ﷺ said, mm-hmm. you can't pro- prohibit a woman from coming to the masjid. Mm-hmm. She can come out for Salat al-Eid because she's got to come out to pray the Eid prayer. Uh, she can come up for Hajj, she can come up for Umrah, she can come out to seek Bye. Islamic advice, to obtain a fatwa from a sheikh. She can come up to study the religion, she can come up to teach the religion as well, provided she's in the correct environment and so on and so forth. She can come out to the marketplace if she's got a need, she can't just be rolling around the marketplace for no reason, but if there's a need, she's got things to buy, she does it, of course, with the condition that we're going to mention. She can't come out without hijab and whatever have you, she's got to come out in the correct circumstances. Um, for work need. If, 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 if there is a need and of course there's conditions to working meaning number one you're, 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 you're correctly dressed and like a lot of sisters they, 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 they message and they say brother can I work for the NHS and apparently I don't know if this is what they say to me apparently you know to be a nurse you have to show your arm you cannot have full sleeves right now that's a job based on that now that would be a problem for you sister because your job that job is necessitating that you compromise your hijab which is it's not, it's, it's, it's not allowed in the hospital, you're moving around, you see what I'm saying? Another condition for wanting to have work is that it does, there's no free mixing involved. You can work without free mixing and there's no khalwa. Khalwa meaning a man and a woman who are haram mm-hmm. for each other to be together because that's the case, shaitan is the third. So, I mean, these are such needs for which a woman might want to go out. And this isn't from you, this isn't from you, this isn't from you, this isn't from me. It's from Allah. This is from Allah in the Quran. And the Prophet said in the hadith of Aisha radiallahu anha, but you've been allowed to come out if there's a need. If there's, the, if Prophet there's a need. Us, the Prophet told us, if there is a need, you've been given permission to come out. Because even you mentioned the first one that no, no one can prevent the woman going to the masjid. And yeah. the Prophet yeah, said sorry. that. But even then, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa did say... And it, well, yeah. it's better for you to that, stay in your house. Yeah. And remember, this is praying behind the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa in his yeah. own masjid. Imagine yeah, the, the virtue said, of that. Behind you. Yeah. Imagine mm. the virtue behind that. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa is telling the woman that what's greater for you, what's more virtuous for you, what's better for you, is rather than pray with me, pray in your local masjid. And what's better for you than that is rather than pray in your local masjid, pray in your home. What's better than you pray in your home? Was it the living room? Or the, or yeah, or basically yeah. your hujra. Yeah. Your hujra. What's better than that is your bedroom, and what's better than your bedroom is the chamber. The chamber in your bedroom. The chamber within your bedroom. So the, the, the prophet is telling you that's more virtuous than praying behind him. Than praying behind him. Imagine the reward of praying in jama'ah with the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. The prophet himself is saying this is more virtuous. So this is Allah. This is not coming from us. This is coming from the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And if if this is something that you know you feel like. No, you know what? No, that's f- like oh, stuff. It's not fine, but in a sense, as long as you accept that, you know, you can't turn around and say, "Oh no, that's not Islamically correct. That's not this." And this is from the Prophet we're giving you. If you struggle with it, everyone has struggles, and you know, you try your best to get over those struggles. As long as you acknowledge what the right thing is yeah. and aspire and try and attain yeah. that and get to that, that's the main thing. That's the main thing. But there are some people out there nowadays who say, "No, this is wrong. This isn't from Islam. This isn't that." It, that's very, very dangerous. You know we actually have a video coming out on this issue of saying I don't like something from the Sharia. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah there's yeah, a yeah. video come out, it's called I don't like my hijab, right? We recorded it, it's going to be out maybe tomorrow. Well, yeah. I don't know what, what the name is, but it's coming out soon. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and basically, people who make statements like that, where they don't like something from the religion, that could be a statement of, kuf- of kufr. So, yeah, so watch out for that video, inshallah. It should be coming soon. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so. Yeah, I was going to say that's scary because there's also the ayah, if I'm not mistaken, where um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, it is not befitting that, you know, um, like Allah and His Messenger, um, what's the ayah? Allah and His Messenger make a decision for you and you and, argue and, and, and you, and you and go you have, against that. Yeah, yeah. And you question. Okay, so now in terms of needs, you've mentioned the different types okay, so of needs. Okay, so we've got to come back to the point Strides was making because that was a side point. The point is free mixing, okay? Free mixing, how did the Sharia prohibit it? it Allah said, stay in your houses. 
and, and yeah, and, and only come out if there's a need. So um, you, the question was that the people have been asking us: is Can men and women sit next to each other? Can they face each other? Can they be sitting facing each other, even if they're sitting on different sides of the room, but they're looking at each other? You know, they might even be all wearing you know appropriate apparent Islamic dressing. But the point is that. How, on what basis can you ever say that that's permissible for that kind of an environment, whether it be a da'wah show or a da'wah kind of event or, you know, whatever it may be. How can you ever say that that's permissible when the asr is, she's not even supposed to be there, she's supposed to be in a house. Why? So she doesn't come and mingle with the men. So if she did come out for her need, she absolutely should not be mingling with the men if she came out. Do you see what I'm saying? I'm and you, do you see what I'm saying? And uh, what's amazing is that Allah didn't stop there. When you look at this, uh, Allah, there's no escape. Like, Allah, there's no escape. Because then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala addresses, if they do come out, if they do come out of their houses, Ya ayyuhan nabi, qul li azwajika wa banatika wa nisa'il mu'minina yudnina alayhinna min jilabi bihinna. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, O Prophet, your wives, your daughters, and the believing women, tell them that they should cover with the jilbab. Now, some of the scholars use this eye as an evidence for niqab, and some use it as an evidence for the jilbab. Okay? Now, I'm not going to go into that discussion right now, but another day, inshallah. But the very minimum is jilbab. What is jilbab? Jilbab is the garment that starts from the top and it flows. It's that one piece that, you know, it doesn't rest on the shoulders. It flows across the shoulders. Yeah? So the point is that you're supposed to stay in the house. Because the, the, the walls of the house are her veil. When she comes out of the house, she doesn't come out, uh, you know, except with the jibab. Yeah. Now, what about a woman now who's not even wearing the jibab? She's wearing a tight hijab, she's got makeup on, and she's got perfume on. And then you want to bring her on to sitting with the men? Yeah. You want to make her sit in front of the men? Yeah. Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah. So, again, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is maintaining that whole issue. That, you know, she, segregation can't happen. She's come out, there's a need. She has to come out. She's got to get her food. She's got to maybe work. She's got to maybe study. No problem. She's come out, but she's still got to be covered. And then now when she comes into a public place in which there might be men, she hasn't come into contact with the men. She's not spoken to no man yet. What did Allah say? Lower your case. Or believe in men. Men, 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 men. Lower your case. Why? Because it protects your private parts. Sort of to know. And then Allah mm -hmm. said to the women in the next ayah, women do lower your gaze too. They still haven't spoken. There's still no discussion between them. They're still not sitting opposite each other. They're still not sitting shoulder to shoulder. But what's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saying? Lower your gaze before the conversation even starts. And then if the conversation was start, what did Allah say in Surah Al-Hazab? He said to the believing women, Don't beautify your voices. He said, Don't beautify your voices. So sisters can't be like, It's not like your brother, how you doing today? Brother Mashallah, you're being a lot like that. She can't be like that. Do you see what I'm saying? She's got to be, Salaam alaikum, brother. She's got to talk like a jinn. <laughs> how do you know how a jinn talks? We do rocket. Yeah. I'm joking, you shouldn't have talked like a jinn. But the point. I, so I was just going to mention yeah. something before it just flies over. Yeah. Um, I was going to mention, you know, you mentioned, and some people might say that, okay, but you just said if she's coming out, you know, to a dawah show or something yeah. pertaining to dawah. Yeah. That's a good thing, that giving dawah and whatnot. Some people might say she's coming out to give dawah, she's coming out to, you know, teach the people. So how, how is it now that that's something that could be bad? And I was going to mention a principle that um, our religion has, which is that, you know, um, you know, removing the harm takes pre precedence over, you know, bringing about the good. Mm. So in this situation, what's the harm? That she's going to go out free mixing. And we know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, stay far away from zina. Mm. And free mixing is one of those things that leads up to zina, zina as we discussed before. So now there's a situation where the sister wants to go out and give da'wah. You know, on a platform, whatever it may be, but she's leaving her house where now she has to go and free mix, which could end up leading to zina. So the bigger harm now is that she could potentially be leading up to fornication yeah. in an attempt to go and try give da'wah to the people. So I just want like to bring that principle as well. Those video from time ago back in your... Uh... I don't know what you even call it, semi jahiliya your jahiliya within Islam, I don't know what you call it, those it days, isn't it? Those, uh, it was jahiliya. Those days. And um, I think you went, not in a club, outside a club, and you were talking to people, blah, blah, blah. And I think one thing is that, obviously, that, was it Osad who mentioned it? Or I can't remember who mentioned it, the issue of 
you can't say, oh, I'm going to go to the club and give that one because you going in that situation in the first place is you put yourself mm. at harm. And as brother just mentioned, you know, you studied quite the fiqhia that repelling the harm takes precedence over bringing the good. Yeah, it's from so the that, Al-Qubra, it's from the yeah, fire. It's, it's from one of the major, you know, one of the major principles of the religion. But another thing I want to just touch upon as well, you mentioned, you know, you said, uh, okay, look, uh, you've got sisters nowadays, you know, who don't dress appropriately and whatnot. May Allah make it easy for you guys. I mean... Um, so the question might, someone might now ask what if she is dressed modestly she's not wearing makeup yeah. she's doing everything correctly Jaleen. she goes outside the point still stands there has to be a need the ayah is general it doesn't specify to those who are correct and those who are not the ayah is general but actually what you have to understand is even if there's a need she still can't sit in front of the men she, it has to be avoided and the worst thing do, is do, do, do you see what I'm unless, unless that need is like um, you know a doctor a, a doctor or do you see what I'm saying? Uh, you know, I'm because of course a doctor can examine a woman's body, but even then he's only allowed to examine that particular part that's hurting. Do you see what I'm saying? Right. So that's if I could just quickly like mention because that's what I was coming to. I was saying like, let's just say she is dressed properly, she's lowering her gaze, but then when she's there, what did Allah subhanahu to say? She can't beautify her voice. And what did Allah say to the men? Allah said, if you're gonna ask the women a question, in Surah Al-Ahzab again, that's if you're gonna ask them a question, ask them behind a minwarai hijab. hijab, behind a barrier. Okay, now some of the ulama, do you want to explain this issue, inshallah ta'ala? No, fadl. Some of the ulama, they mention, it depends on your madhab. If you believe that niqab is wajib, which is the view that we're inclined to, inshallah ta'ala, uh, then that means that this, that if you're going to ask her this question, it has to be behind her hijab. Sorry, her niqab, she has to be wearing a niqab if, she's gonna, if you're going to ask her a question. But if you're inclined to the view that niqab is not wajib, and you're inclined to the view that jilbab is wajib, okay, uh, then that means your house, you, you know, the, 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 a physical barrier. Do you see what I'm saying? But the point is actually all of this is taking place. All of this is happening. Why? To prevent the free mixing. Now, this hadith, Allah, if I mention it, is the one that really just closed the discussion. Like, no one after this can argue in any way shape and tell me this is for the sake of that or this is for the sake of, you know, blah, blah. This hadith just closes the game. Yeah? And the hadith of the Prophet, alayhi um, I just want to check where it's narrated because I don't want to see... We have to, we must give references. Ahlul Sunnati wa Jama'a, we do what? Give references. We give references. We don't speak from our own desires. We don't make up things as we go along. We mention what the Prophet alayhi salatu was salam said. And we mention those who, you know, took from the hadith what we're saying. Exactly. The, the scholars who understood like scholars this. Scholars who understood it like uh, Okay, Imam Sahih Muslim. I just wanted to double check. Sahih Muslim. So the hadith is narrated Sahih Muslim. So authentic narration. And it's narrated by Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu. And look what he said. Basically, in the message of the Prophet alayhi salam, there was no barriers. So the men used to pray in the front and the women used to pray in the back. That was the way that they would segregate. Okay, this is the Prophet's segregation. Now pay attention. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi is saying in the salah, the best line for the men is the front. right in the front. And the best line for the women is right in the back. Why? The is it because is it women should be behind, they're low? No. It's because that separate. makes the men and women the furthest apart. Right? And then the Prophet Ali said that the worst line for the men is in the back. And the worst line for the women is in the front. Because the men who are in the back and the women who are in the front are closest, closest to each, to each, other, each other. other. So you see, what is the Prophet trying to prohibit? The intermingling. SubhanAllah, that's in the masjid. Yeah, exactly. SubhanAllah. So you have to understand, this is in Salah. The, in the Prophet's masjid. At a time when the slave is most closest to Allah. At a time when the slave is most fearful. What do I say? قَدْ أَفْلَحَ الْمُؤْمِنُونَ الَّذِينَ هُمْ فِي صَلَاتِهِمْ خَاشِعُونَ The believers are the ones who in their salah, they were خُشُوا خَشَعِفْ Scared. The Sahaba were the, the best of believers. And they were in the midst of the Prophet. In, they're in the midst of the Prophet The slave is the closest to Allah and his desires are the most farthest away from him. The last thing you're thinking about behind the Prophet when you're seeing revelation come in front of you, you've seen the moon split, you saw it split with your own eyes, you know the power that Allah subhanahu wa has. There's no shak in any way, shape or form. The last thing you're going to be thinking about is, oh, let me check the sister behind me. But what the Prophet say? In the message, in that environment. Then the question comes, Kaif, Akhi, what if you're not in the salah and not in the masjid? Okay. And you're here today. Is there any greater act than the salah? No. I'm asking you, is there any greater act than the salah? No. Your five time obligatory prayer? No. no. So is you 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 you're, you you do da'wah, you bring people together, you know, are you are you is your your act of worship better than the salah? That it necess, that it's an exception to what the Prophet has said about the salah? No. 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 Also another point just to mention to add on to what you mentioned is the fact that obviously in some situations as the brother has already mentioned, it is unavoidable. You go to hospital, you have to sit with a doctor, yeah. you know, it's not like the Muslims are running 
So it's not like a Muslim run hospital. Yeah. We, we don't live in the Muslim lands. You know, there's places you go outside, you have to go shopping, you have to do this. When you have got a need, in some places it is unavoidable. But it is only befitting that when we do go to a place where it's controlled by Muslims, for example, the masajid, you know, centers, da'wah centers, whatever it may be, that they take all the means possible to do the best they can to prevent the free mixing. Because yes, it's in their power. It's in your control. It's in your control. Like, for example, when we do our events, every <coughs> single event we do, we always have the sisters at the back and the brothers at the front. No exceptions. Like in the Prophet's Masjid. Just like the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's Masjid. And that's because that, for that time being, that venue is in our control. It's in our control. So we can do this. No one can come and say, mm, but you know, bro, this and that. If it is in your control, it's upon you to take every, every mean possible to prevent that. So what does that show about the person who it's in his control, it's his event, it might be his, whatever it is, his little project, yeah? But yeah, he still refuses to do that. There's a people of desire. There's a disease like in your heart. Disease. Does that not show? Does that not show that there's a, there's a disease in your heart? And I'm going to explain to you exactly who it was because I have a book here. You see this little book right here? Book is powerful. It's a little book. It's but all on the issue of free mixing. It's all on the issue of free mixing and it's refuting... It's a particular sect, I'm going to tell you a bit about them in a second, who are the, who are the ones who basically in the 21st century, they try to, to up this free mixing thing and say men and women are free mix and whatever have you. So we'll come to that. But it shows that the person, his aqidah is corrupt in his, God, this is not. And also, just inshallah, Saad, if you can elaborate on this, because I remember we discussed it the other day. Because you know, Bakr just said something deep. He just said, brothers and sisters, we're not saying, you know, uh, in uh, you know situations of necessity and great dire need that men and women can't sit next to each other. For example, a doctor. If you if you go to a male doctor, you, you need to go to a gynecologist or whatever have you, and he happens to be a male, we're not saying you can't not sit with him to examine you, right? Uh, but the reason why he had to mention that is because sadly, people just always bring up, you know, exceptional circumstances as if to say the exceptional circumstance uh, now can be used as an evidence to destroy the general ruling. Can you just expand on that because we were discussing it the other day? Yeah, um... Which is the point that I mentioned to you because I remember one time where uh, um, we were doing a, a lot of fiqh, we were studying with uh, um, Usad al and um, I kept asking questions in regarding to the exceptional rules yeah. for everything. Yeah. So Usad al he looked at me, he said, he said, he said, Sa'ad, he said, stop asking about the exception. Yeah. He said, what's the point in asking for an exception when the exceptions are always there? Yeah. Okay, we are more focused with the general ruling because that's what we have to. Um, strive to implement in mm. our lives The istithna'at The exceptions They only come When there is an exception yeah. So for every single rule In the religion Every ahkam Every fiqh ruling That there is You'll find there is an exception Right There will be some sort of exception Some kind of necessity will come When there is a need even, When there is a necessity Even an exception To drink alcohol Exactly You have to die Exactly So there's no point In us even asking about those Unless it is a necessity yeah. Just stick with the general ruling If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Has made it impermissible For us to free mix If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Says that it is better For the women to stay in their houses Then stick to the general ruling Don't worry about the exceptions The exceptions will come When the necessity comes uh, At the same time Right Other than that Leave it to the side But nowadays What a lot of people do They see the general ruling they come across the exception as well yeah, And they make true. the exception the, the general rule Exactly okay? they, 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 they try to take that as the asal for everything And wallahi that is truly a disease That is a disease of the people's yeah. hearts Wallahi It like, just shows ignorance Exactly It's, it's, it's pure it's ignorance desires. It's desires It's ignorance When that's an exception That only came due to a necessity And you want to know just because one sheikh, he gave a fatwa and he said, Oh no, um, sister, you're allowed to do this. Um, you're allowed to be with the brothers in this situation. Methalan, right? As an example, if a sheikh ever gave a fatwa like that. And I would say, you, you make it public, you let other people hear that, that becomes a general rule for the people. Yeah. But the sheikh was given it based on a necessity. Exactly. On one particular situation. Oh, yeah, on it's, it's like someone saying, like you just mentioned, the issue of the doctor. Or well, the doctor, I have to sit in front of the doctor, so why can't I sit in front of my yeah. teacher at school? Or why can't I do this? Or why can't I do it? Just someone to do it, you know? Like, people are just going to come that. up and just use that. And it's called extrapolation. They'll just, you know, use that and try and put it out there yeah. and, you know, outside of the bounds that were set for yeah. that particular issue. Another thing I want to mention is that obviously, you know, some people might turn around and uh, say to you, look, okay, fine. You guys brought, you know, Quran, you brought Sunnah, you brought the evidence to the scholars, but I have an issue, right? Um, obviously, no one understood. 
these issues after the Prophet ﷺ better than the Sahaba, right? Sahih. So now, for example, people might come, you know, as we've seen online, uh, bring the issue of Umar uh, radiallahu anhu, uh, who appointed uh, a woman, he said in that narration, he appointed a woman to uh, head the market. Now, someone might come and say, wait, look, you're saying that, you know, there shouldn't be free mixing. Is this not free mixing? Are you saying that Umar radiallahu anhu didn't know what he was doing? Are you saying that he went against free mixing and that he made free mixing happen? Is that what you're trying to say? So, the, 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 uh, does the Sheikh mention anything to do with that uh, in, in this book? Wow, this is very sad. That anyone who knew Umar bin Khattab radiallahu anhu and try and use Umar bin Khattab radiallahu anhu as... As a justification to let men and women free mix. Right. Allah, I'm going to read you some statements of Umar bin Khattab on the issue of free mixing so you can make your decision yourself. But before I do that, I just want to mes- mention this apparent narration. Firstly, the people who mention this narration to us, and I've seen it flying around in the comments of Instagram and whatnot, they never mention a reference. Um, till now, I haven't seen a reference for this narration. I've not seen any reference for it. Where did you? Where is this narrated from? You have to understand, Akhi, Ahl Sunnati wa Jama'at, which is the only sect that will be saved on the Day of Judgment from the Hellfire out of the seventy-three sects. Akhi, they are people of transmission, people of chain, chains of narration. I, the Abdul uh, Mubarak uh, used to say, if it wasn't for the Isnad, if it wasn't for the chain of narration, a person would have said whatever he would have wanted about this religion. Uh, Imam Zuhr, yeah. Rahim, huh? A statement al min al-Din al min al-Din The chain of religion is our religion Imam Zuhri rahim Allah, what did he say? He, someone said to him Just leave the chain, just give me the hadith Don't tell me the reference of, you know Fulan, f- an fulan, haddathana, fulan, akhbarna, f- fulan Just tell me the hadith He said, you want to get to the top of the roof without the ladder um, You can't do that And that's what separates Islam from all the other from religions, all the other religions. Exactly. Christianity doesn't have a chain there's a gap of hundreds of years between people. Exactly. Who the Bible. Do you see what I'm saying? So, so this is the difference between us and them. And sad that Muslims are now falling into this characteristic. The first thing to be where is this narrated? Number one, when you know where it's narrated, second thing you need to know is is it authentically Authentic. narrated? And as for this narration, Ibn Hajar al Asqalani rahimahullah placed the question mark on its authenticity. But who is Ibn Hajar? Explain to us. He was Ibn Ibn Hajar rahimahullah. <laughs> For us to try and explain it is, about, is an insult to him. He's a mountain of hadith. He's one who has what scholars even to today say that is the best explanation of Imam Bukhari Sahih. Not only that, when it came to understanding Imam Bukhari, he spent 16 years writing the introduction of how Imam Bukhari, like, Ibn Hajar knew hadith. Just period. If you don't know, get to know. I'm not going to talk about the Shaykh, rahimahullah, as he said. Ghaniyun an ta'arif. Who was it who said that when Imam Bukhari wrote his book? Saab Dhaman has a. Uh, a video uh, on just a bit about the life of Ibn Hajar. So we'll put it okay. in the we'll put it in the link in below. The link below. The thing is, we always say people always get onto us, and we always say we're gonna put it in the link below. So make sure you get and someone always forgets in it. Below the Maram, it's the first lesson, the first two three lessons, all about Ibn Hajar's life. Okay, so now okay. all three of you heard so it. You know, so one and Ibn Hajar three. placed a question mark on his narration. Okay, mm-hmm. but let me give you some narrations that are authentic, and I'm gonna mention to you the references for them. Let's start with. Let's start with Umar ibn Khattab عنه, because he's the one that people are trying to use. And sorry, just to say, and let's just say it is authentic. Do you think that the woman was in the marketplace um, uh, without her proper address? Do you think that the men were talking? Do you think she was face to face with the men? Can't you be in charge of a marketplace? But like when you find, like for example, you go Kingston High Street and then you know you've got them council guys that are running around. They have an office. You, you don't think she would be in her equivalent of an office or her equivalent of a thing, just running things from there? Do you really think she was mingling with the men? Hey, man, how are you doing? Like, do you really think it was like that? How's the business today? Yeah, how when you have, I think the hadith is in, 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 in Sunnah Tirmidhi, if I'm not mistaken, but it's in one of the six books of hadith, yeah? But I think it's Sunnah Tirmidhi. Uh, I'm pretty sure it's Sunnah, but it's in one of the six books, so I've given you. It's in one of the six books, you can check it, inshallah ta'ala. And what was it that the Prophet said when he came out on the people? He saw the men and women mixing in the marketplaces. So he said to the women, stay back. Don't come to the middle of the road. Men, stay don't mix the with the edges. women. Yeah, women have to stay on the edges. So the narrator said after that that the women were so close to the edge. They were so close to the edge that their, garments their garments used to yeah. brush past the edge. So you think that if this woman was running the marketplace, do you think she's in the middle of the men? Do you really think that, 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 that that's no, how it would happen? I, I think it's even more than just brush past. I think it tear. The garments used to tear. That's how, how, how close that's it how was. how close they were to the walls. Subhanallah. So that's how it was. But let's go to Umar ibn Khattab to show you his position on the, on the hijab. This narration that I'm going to mention to you is narrated by none other than Imam al-Bukhari in his Sahih. 
okay? Imam Bukhari in the Sahih narrated this. It's authentic. You go check it. It's Kitab Tafsir, okay? Before hijab even became obligatory, what was Umar ibn Khattab's view in hijab? Basically, he came to the Prophet ﷺ. He said, Ya Rasulullah, sometimes people come to you. They come to you. Yeah, they visit you or whatnot. And sometimes a good man. He's a righteous. Sometimes a fadji. He's a filthy person. You know, because there was munafiqun. There was hypocrites. And sometimes they play games. So, sometimes a guy is coming to you. Like, imagine, you, you know, someone comes to my house. He comes to visit me. He's good. Sometimes he's bad. So, the Umar said, like, be good, you know, to tell the women, to tell your wives and whatnot, to stop wearing the proper, you know, to stop covering themselves. Because you don't want one man to accidentally see them or anything like that. You know, he might come in with a bad intention. Akhi, when that happened, Allah sent down the eye of hijab. Subhanallah. The eye of hijab, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed it based on Umar ibn Khattab going to the Prophet Ali mm-hmm. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam saying, totally, you know, we good if the women they wore hijab. Allah. He, he was me, the reason. He was the, <laughs> he, that, that was the sabab. That was the reason for revelation. Um, His, him going to the Prophet Ali Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So you're telling me Umar ibn Khattab that the women walk around in the marketplace? Also, on the issue of Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu, Ibn Hajar al-Asqalani, rahimullah, the same sheikh we just mentioned, he narrates uh, that Ibrahim and Nakhi, rahimullah, said that Umar ibn Khattab, radiallahu anhu, used to actually prevent the women from doing tawaf with the men. He used to stop the men and women from doing tawaf together. Akhi, tawaf. Even though the strongest view that the ulama that they came with is that the men and women can do the tawaf together, but we're talking about Umar. We're not saying that this is the strongest view necessarily, but we're talking about Umar because you question Umar. Yeah. You brought Umar radiallahu anhu as a, as a justification for you. So we're telling you this man radiallahu anhu who prevented the men and women from doing tawaf together. You're telling me he allowed men and women to free mix in the market and you're using that as a justification for your uh, da'wah projects or whatever else it may be? Yeah? And what did Umar used to do? The narration mentioned if he saw a man and a woman together, he would beat the man. Anhu. We're not telling you to go beat no one, but you're telling you bring Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu. This is, this is it. Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha. Again, and I mentioned the narration to you. Um, Imam al-Shafi'i rahimullah narrated this. Imam al-Shafi'i rahimullah narrated this. It's in his Muslim. Uh, Aisha radiallahu anha, a woman came to her and she said, Ya Ummin Mu'mineen, I touched the black stone. I touched the corners of the Kaaba. Because you know, Which is you know, a virtuous thing to and do. And she said, what? May Allah not reward you. May Allah not reward you. Why? You mingled with the men. Because it's true nowadays, in order to get to the black stone, you have yeah, to go. That was that time. Actually, this comes back to the point he made. Is it good to touch the black stone? Of course it is. Is it a harm to touch the men? Yes. But the, the religion takes precedence is what? To push away the harm. The harm. Yeah. Even me, I've been there. Wallah, I've been to go to touch the black stone. Wallah, me and you were there together. And the women kept brushing. I said, A'udhu billahi min dalek. It's a haram. I'm not going to go. When, when we went, there was a woman, I actually physically with my own eyes saw her, her because, because of the hustling and bustling, Number one, her hijab got pulled off. Her hijab came off of her head. And number three, she got crushed. Yes, she's there, she started screaming, whatnot, blah, blah, blah. And then obviously, there's, there's mashallah, these guys there who, you know, their job is to, you know, protect one. So they came and, they, you know, they separated it and got her up and whatnot and told her what move it. And, you know, it's, it's, it's so clear that, you know, there's a big harm that comes from it. Of course, it, it is praiseworthy, it is rewardable. But remember, there's a reason, there's a wisdom behind everything in this religion. It's like a woman in my a sister in my family, she went, she managed to go at a time where there was not much rush and she touched it, no problem. But you go and you got to come and hustle and bustle with the men, it's a problem. You, you're being prevented from acts of worship because you might free mix, okay? Look at this. Well, like this narration, well, like, it touched my heart. This narration I'm going to mention to you touched my heart. And it's narrated, Imam al-Qurtubi, rahimahullah, he brings this in his uh, tafsir of the Qur'an, okay? Imam al-Shawkani, rahimahullah, brings it in his Fatr al-Qadir, which is his tafsir of the Qur'an as well. This is Sauda, radiallahu anhu, Sauda, the wife of the Prophet, alayhi sallam. The first woman that the Prophet, alayhi sallam, married after Khadija, radiallahu anhu. She was an older woman, okay? And the Prophet, alayhi sallam, married her. Basically, look, they came, to, uh, they came to her and they said to her, are you not going to go and do Hajj and Umrah like your sisters? Because like we said, one of the reasons a woman can leave her house is, and uh, one of the needs we said earlier is Hajj and Umrah, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. So they came to her and said, are you going to not leave your house like your, like your sisters? Yeah. And um, look what she said. She said, I done Hajj and I done Umrah. Then Allah commanded, وَقَرْنَ فِي بُيُوتِكُنَّ Stay in your houses. I'm not going to leave my house. Could she have left the house? No. Yeah, she could have. Could she have gone to the marketplace? Yeah, she could have. But to show you the the level of because we're talking about Sahaba. Because because you brought Umar ibn Khattab, I'm bringing you. I brought you Umar, now I'm bringing you Aisha. Now I'm bringing you Sauda, the best women. Radiyallahu anhunna. Right? These are the greatest women. So I'm bringing the example. She refused to come out of the house, Akhi. And the narrator of the Hadith said, Wallahi, she did not come out of the house and accept her funeral. Subhanallah. I can go in, Akhi. Aisha radiyallahu anha had who buried in her house? Umar the Prophet Ali Sallam. And then who was buried? The moment Umar got buried, because Umar is buried in the house. When you go, you see, right? That's the house of the, uh, Aisha radiallahu anha. She started wearing her niqab inside the house, bro. Because of a man who had passed. Because a man, but he's dead. 
He's dead. She wants to be shy, modest from a dead man. Akhi Fatima radiallahu anha. Because you brought Sahaba, we're bringing you Sahaba. I'm only mentioning, I'm not telling my sisters, you know, say you have to do this, right? But I'm showing you this, you, this is the way they understood it. Fatima radiallahu anha said, when, I, when, when you're taking me on my janazah, you know, you've got to wrap the person up in the coffin, in the white cloth. She said, place something over me, because I don't want the people to see the shape of my body. Akhi, she wants to be modest in death, bruv. That's what all these women were like. And now you're telling me, well, I can go in. Okay. Now I've got more narrations. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu, Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu. Yeah. I can go in. I won't. I yeah. won't. Yeah, because it's a bit time. But just want to mention one point, then I want to ask one question. Uh, the point I want to mention is also. Why are you talking, bro? No, no, you guys are doing a good job. Fadda, fadda. Let me just make a point and then ask a question. <laughs> Maybe you might be able to answer it. The uh, point I want to mention is a lot of people online um, that we've seen recently, you know, I'm saying, brother, you guys. Coming out with your own fatawa, coming out with your own explanations, coming out with you know you guys are making the religion hard. You guys are doing this. You guys are doing this. You know, um, but it's sad because we turn around and say, look, so so far I don't know, man. You guys can maybe go through the video and count how many different scholars we've mentioned who have interpreted this from these evidences. And specifically, many, what scholars are you mentioning? Like the Sahaba, as well as you know, we're mentioning, for example, you know, Ibn Qayyim was mentioned. You mentioned Ibn Hajar, Imam, uh, Imam Shokani. This is what they understood from these evidences. But if you look at, for example, you know, uh, people who are f uh, throwing around the issue of uh, Umar radiallahu an, I'm saying, who from the ulama, who from the scholars, took this hadith, took this evidence, and who understood it the way you understood it? You know, there's people out there saying, you know, we, we always take it back to the scholars. We always refer back to the scholars. You know, we, 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 we don't do this thing where, you know, you, like these people who are young, the jahil, you know, they do their own thing. You know, they go against the scholars. I'm saying, who from the scholars? Bring one scholar, one, one alim, one scholar who came and said, this hadith of Umar is used as an evidence to say that, you know, women and men can mix or women can, make, you know, be in a certain situation in a certain way. That is something which is missing, and it's a bit, you know, I see it to be a bit of double standards. You know, in fact, that you know, have yeah, the You know, on that point, yeah. Sorry, and you even brought uh, on the ayah of the of the Kathir, Mujahid, Rahimullah. Where are the scholars? Actually, you know, what I was going to mention this is a proper, proper like disease that's within our ummah nowadays. That the youth and many of these du'at and people who are known to be Islamic speakers, yeah. They're disconnecting the people from the scholars. And when a person gets disconnected from the scholars, we know the scholars are the ones who, you know, know the religion better than us. They've been, alhamdulillah, blessed. With, we were told in the Quran you know, to go back to exactly. the scholars. And when now the, the youth, especially people who don't have much understanding of the religion, aren't going back to the scholars to gain understanding, this is a problem. And this is exactly what many of the du'at and many of these so-called Islamic speakers are doing. They're disconnecting the people from the scholars of the religion. And they're giving their own, you know, interpretations and they're just spreading falsehood amongst the youth. And that's why there's so, many, so much confusion amongst the youth nowadays on such matters like this. Because they don't go and refer the matters back to the scholars. They just and when they do, they say, oh, I spoke to the people of knowledge about this. Who? Men. Who? Who, exactly. You don't mention no names. Tell us who. Reasons because there are the people who, you know, like, uh, who, who actually say it's impermissible, who, you know, you go back to. It's like, it's like people, some people, you know, when, when, it's like they pick and choose when to follow certain people. I'm saying, on what basis do you choose? Okay, on this issue, I'm going to follow them. On this issue, I'm going to follow them. On this issue, I'm going to follow them. What's the basis? Thing, What's the basis behind which? But well, there's one question I mentioned. I want to make a point, then I want to ask a question, and maybe one of you guys might be able to answer. Before you ask, can I just say something? Yeah. Father, I know brothers and sisters probably can see from my face I'm probably angry right now. Yeah. I'm not gonna lie. Like you know, I know I get a lot of you know, brothers and sisters. They advise me, say, brother, you know, take calm. You're a bit harsh when you speak. And, whatnot. and lately, I've been proper trying to, you know, improve myself in that. Like I do take advice when people give it to me, even if it's in the comments. I don't want anyone to think I don't. I know sometimes the way I come across could be a bit rough and tough in it. Right Trust now, me, we refute him more than anyone else. I mean, like right now, even, and, even, and even I'm conscious of that and I'm trying so hard that like I'm saying to myself, Imran, fix your face. Like I, can, I, I, can, I, can, like it's like I can feel the tension on my face right now, yeah? And I'm telling myself, calm down, like you're coming across like that. But Wallahi, you know, I can't help it, man. When you, when you play with the religion of Allah like that, Wallahi, bruv. Wallahi, you know how angry that makes mm. me, bruv. You're playing. And like the Prophet Ali Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Aisha radiallahu anhu, said he never got angry for his own reason, except if the boundary of Allah was transgressed. It's not necessarily wrong to be angry in this situation, but I just don't want anyone to think, you know, this is whatever. I'm just, wallahi, sincerely. Wallahi, sincerely. I actually feel like crying right now. You know, when you've got people who are supposed to be taken as people of, uh, as community leaders, 
in the religion and and then you play with a religion like this it hurts man I've got a question though yeah that some people have been asking some people might bring up they say okay look these ayah that you've mentioned are they not specific to the wives of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam do do they apply generally can you know because people say that no this is specific that you know the stay in your house is specific to to the wives of the Prophet so you say oh you need to have a hijab you need to have a barrier routine specific to the wives of the Prophet so I mean I believe correct me if I'm wrong that the, the sheikh in this same book addresses this issue and he brings mashallah to a lot of a very 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 solid argument as to why this why this can't be true do you want to go into it Osad? do you want to do you want to go into this issue you got the the tafsir of can I just say one thing in it yeah can I just say one thing in it before I go into this in it yeah just leading on from what you just mentioned earlier in it obviously the whole show in it I practically haven't spoken a word except for a little thing that I said and the reason why I haven't spoken is because once we started and the conversation was going on and I was just sitting here, I'm like, why are we doing a video on the issue of free mixing? Like, why? This is what's coming to mind. Understand. The shubha that the people bring up here, where they say, um, they say it's the Prophet Ali Sassan's wives. Sheikh addresses it here. يا نساء النبي لستن كأحد من نساء الله سبحانه وتعالى said a few verses before Allah told the women stay in your house before Allah سبحانه وتعالى told the women don't beautify your voice before he said these things Allah سبحانه وتعالى told the women uh, when Allah said these things before that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said O oh, wives of the Prophet you are not like any other woman so the people say oh staying in your house because Allah said you're not like any other woman Allah's talking to the Prophet's wives so this doesn't apply this doesn't apply, apply. but that is a s- extreme lack of understanding of the Quran and the way that you do to see of the Quran <coughs> so one of the ways that you understand an ayah is you look at the what you call the sabiq and the lahiq. In other words, the context. The, what, that which came before that and that which came after. So if when Allah said, Ya, uh, ya nisa al nabi, lastunna ka ahadim min nisa, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, O oh, women of the Prophet, you are not like any other woman, the way for you to understand what, when Allah said, You are you're unique, you're not like any other woman, what's he talking about? You've got to go to the ayah before to understand what Allah's talking about. And if you go to the ayah before you find that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he mentioned that over the Prophet may yati min kunna bi fahishatin mubayyinatin yudha'af laha al-adhaab wa dhi'fain For you there will be a double punishment Allah said to the wives of the Prophet if you come with filth if you come with fahsha you're going to get a double punishment your punishment will be double from the other women So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said oh wives of the Prophet you're not like any other woman that's what he meant the, why you not like any other woman? They won't get double pu- uh, punished double. You'll get punished double. Why? Because your wives are the prophet. Like if a scholar goes and does a sin, it's worse than if a jahid, if an ignorant person does a skin, does a sin. These women, the wives of the prophet, are scholars in their own right. Aisha radiallahu anha was more knowledgeable than a huge majority of the companions. She was from the most knowledgeable sahaba of the prophet. She's right there in the top 10, top 5, you could even say. You could argue. Huh? She's right there at the top. So if she does a sin, She's going to get double punishment, Allah saying. And that is what's unique to the wives of the Prophet, Not the issue of staying in your house. Not the issue of not beautifying your voice. In fact, if you... Do, do you understand? So when Allah said, you're going to get double punishment, 
And then he said, because you're not like any other woman. Then Allah stopped talking about them specifically. Now Allah's talking about women in general. He says to the women, when, you, when, you, when, when a man asks you a question, you speak behind hijab. If you speak to the men, don't beautify your voice and this is a disease in his heart. Stay in your houses, don't come out. Otherwise it means that, for example, anyone can beautify their voice. Yeah. Anyone can go exactly. and speak out for, for no reason. I, exactly. Anyone can go and do it. You know, exactly. Because exactly. 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 you, you can't just say, oh, this only the Prophet's wives have to stay in the houses. You can't. Everything that Allah mentioned in that list, you have to say it was for the Prophet's wives. That means your wife can go and talk beautifully. So do you want to send your wife? I'm just saying hypothetically, you know, any brother, would you like, you know, your wife to be like to one of the brothers here? I'm like, brother, Abu Bakr, how are you doing? I love your child, my bike. Like, would you like her to do that? No, bruv. You're not going to let that happen. You're going to say, that's haram. How dare you do that? My wife, you're betraying me the way you're flirting with this man. So is it only the Prophet's wives who are not allowed to speak in that way? No, even your wife is not allowed to. And then the, in the same list, Allah mentions she can't come out of her house and this is a need. And what's even more amazing is right after Allah mentioned that, Allah continues. Nasara Establish the prayer Is it only for the Prophet's wife to establish the prayer? No, every woman Wa'atina zakat Give the zakat Is it only the Prophet's wife who gives zakat? Wa'ati'ana Allah wa Rasul Obey Allah and his messenger Is it only for Allah and his messenger To be obeyed by the Prophet's wives And no other woman is supposed to obey Allah, his messenger, uh, Allah and his messenger? Every woman has to obey it. So that shows you That this is talking to all the women And the only time when Allah was specifically talking to the Prophet's wives When he talked about the punishment being doubled You see? And I believe It was your Ustaz Abu Rahman who was telling us when uh, that this is one of the characteristics of the people of innovation, the people of desires. For example, the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he says, Kullu bid'atin dalala wa kullu dralatin fin nar. They say, Kullu bid'ah doesn't mean, it doesn't mean all innovation. Yeah. It means some. It's, it means not, some. it's, it's not too much. Yeah, we should but specify then that, generalizations. But then that necessitates that the next kullu, which is all misguidance is in the hellfire, so does that not mean all as well? All misguidance, like they, exactly. They choose when they, when that, you know, when it's specific, when it's thing, and this is all... They make the exception. See, this is why I've studied usul fiqh. Because like, you've studied very, usul very fiqh, you can't play now, isn't it? Like, you can't play now. You can't play that. That's, that's, that's what the, the real man said. If it wasn't for Imam al-Shafi'i, who codified the science of usul al-fiqh, the, pe- the people would have misunderstood the Quran and the Sunnah, right? So you can't play now. We know generalization. We know specific. We know this is general. We know this is exception. They want to use exception as the generalization. They want to uh, and they want to specify the general. They want to restrict the. Un- uh, uh, they want to restrict the unrestricted. The unrestricted. The unrestricted. The unrestricted. Do you see what I'm saying? They play games. So Saad, you have here the, the, the tafsir of uh, Imam Muhammad uh, Amin al-Shaqiti, right? Naam. So uh, in, in regards to the ayah in the Quran, which you mentioned, I, th- I think you mentioned it before. Uh, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that uh, وَإِذَا سَأَلْتُمُوهُنَّ مَتَاعًا فَسَأَلُوهُنَّ مِنْ وَرَائِ الْحِجَابِ They said the same way like Hijab, sorry um, That if you, uh, when you, if you are to, if you're to ask them Then ask them with, uh, from, uh, from behind the hijab, right? Behind a, uh, now like you mentioned the veil what, what, what is the veil? Is it naqab or is it etc? But the point being hijab, right? And a lot of people, they mention this verse as well is only specific to the wives of the Prophet Ali Salatu Wasalam. Well, here I have um, a tafsir, okay? Adwal Bayan by Muhammad uh, Al-Amin Al-Shinqiti. And um, if you guys don't know, then uh, get to know. And if I'm correct, I think it was Bakr Abu Zayd who no. said, Rahimahullah, that if there was anyone that was is to be what was to be deserved to be called Shaykh al Islam of this era, it would have been Muhammad Amin al Shaqiti. Okay, that title Shaykh al Islam is befitting for a man of his caliber. Um, so in his tafsir, okay, no, no, that if you just mentioned this is the the ulama they say the best tafsir of the Quran when it comes to tafsir of Quran with other verses of the Quran, exactly. and he did this all at the top of his head, by the way. Good. And that's the title, that's the, the name of the book as well, right? It's called Adwal Bayani. Okay, clarifying the Quran with the Quran. Okay? And just mention again, this is off the top of his head. Huh? <laughs> exactly. It's he wrote the whole book off the top of his head. This is the caliber of, of, of the scholars of Ahl Sunnah. Well, like, the scholars of Ahl Sunnah are well known. He memorized the six volume dictionary. Al Isan al Arab, word for word, <laughs> cover to cover, the whole book. And you can sometimes you find it ten volumes, sometimes you find it more volumes, okay? And when I mean the volume, I mean one volume is probably like this thick. It's fat. Memorize this is, it. This this is all together like eight, nine volumes itself. This is one volume. <coughs> this is Adwal Bayan, right? Um in this he mentions, right? So the same ayah that's al Tumuhuna, when you asked him, asked him from the uh, from behind the hijab, he said when you look at this ayah, in the very same ayah, right after it, it mentions the illa, the reasoning why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told them, okay, 
not to uh, to to basically have a hijab before uh, if you want to ask them a question and allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said dhalikum atharu li qulubikum wa qulubihinna allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that for you it is more purifying for the men's hearts and the female's hearts okay the point that the shaykh mentions in this he said look this is what allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying regarding uh, the wives of the prophet ali sallallahu alaihi wasallam okay that it's more pure for them um, uh, for, for their hearts but we know that the wives of the prophet ali sallallahu alaihi wasallam that they had the most purest of hearts okay so no doubt if a person has a filthier heart then minbab al awla it's more needing for them to apply this rule to them none of our hearts is as pure as them exactly so every other woman other than the wife of the prophet the wives of the prophet ali sallallahu alaihi wasallam this ayah falls under them they fall under this ayah okay? just explain you know what minbab al awla means just for people that understand for example it means like uh, from the angle of uh, for example like in the quran you translate it okay so minbab basically like, if you, you just give the example of uff oh, okay so you know what subhanahu wa ta'ala said yeah. don't say uff to your mom so can you say now, oh, I can hit my mom though? Just someone might turn around and say, look, Allah said I can't say off. I don't say off. I punch my mom. Yeah. So that's all. But of course, the reason you can't punch her is because anything above any, that. Yeah, Allah mentioned the minimum. You can't say off. So the school say, min babi awla. They say, what's even higher than off is of course going to be prohibited. Mm-hmm. Allah told you the minimum you can't do. So that's what he's trying to say. He's trying to say that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if you just say, if you say for argument's sake, this is only about the Prophet's wives. Then what about those? Then we're going to say, hold up. The reason Allah said, do this, is so your hearts can be pure, right? Now their hearts are already pure. They were the most pious, most most fearing, most taqo, you know, the most pious, the most modest. Not only that, their community, their society was the most modest. In that situation, Allah is telling them so their hearts can be pure. What about me and you whose hearts are far from being pure? So it only makes sense if they were told, and that's the minimum. For them to be told, that's the minimum. Danger. Yeah? For them, the danger is minimum. For us, the danger is going to be higher. And again, this is not us. This is not him. This is not him. This is not him. This I'm is from the danger. scholars. This is from the ulama. Can we just address that one? Sorry, sorry, sorry. Can I just say one thing in it? Yeah. Can, like, course, can we just start to? Are we in, in, towards the end now? Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. But I just want to say one point in it. Yeah. Wallahi, 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 wa billahi, wa tallahi. Anybody who just reads and just studies and takes a portion of their life to do that, these things become clear to us. Wallahi, Because we used to believe the same clear. things. Wallahi. For us, back in our days when we first started to give da'wah, for us it was like, oh, you know, a little bit of, you know, men and, you know, brothers and sisters can be together, no problem. It's for the great good. It's for the great good. Allah prohibited it. Impermissible. And it's not even something which is debatable. It's so clear cut. Okay, it's clear cut. Like <laughs> yeah, well, like, it's so clear cut. Like, it's, it's stupid for us. It, it's funny. It, it would seem stupid to, for maybe the companions that why are we out here making a video like this? Well, what's the need for it? Like, it's. The Umar Adal might actually. Maybe he might. I mean, like. like slap us. Yeah, slap us. Like, why are you talking about this? Like, is it. Like, see what I'm saying? Like, but it's like, it's sad the fact that people really want to water down the religion and try to change aspects of the religion, which are so clear the last point in the whole... Well, there's, I have to mention the refutation as well. That's important for people to know because this is related to aqidah. It's not just a fiqh issue. But just quickly, you know, some people might be arguing, but actually that was in those times. We live in different times. You know, this this common question comes up. Actually, that was those times. Well, my brothers and sisters, the Prophet Ali was sent to every single one of you and me, his time and our time. For us, to, this is an insult to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to say that he revealed the Quran and was Allah Azza wa ignorant of the time to come that he wouldn't make something relevant for us? And the evidence of for us, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said to the Prophet, say, Qul ya nas. Allah told the Prophet, say to us, O people, inni Rasulullahi ilaykum jami'an. I am a Prophet that verily has been sent from Allah to you, all of you, every human being, across all times and all places. All times and all places. The humans in Antarctica, in the North Pole, the humans in Finland, the humans in uh, Africa, ev- humans in Australasia, everywhere, okay? The Prophet Isaac said, that, not just them, even a jinn. Even a jinn. No jinn can say, oh, these revelations, these rules are just for the humans. No, even a jinn, the Prophet was sent to him. The Prophet said, Allah said, we have not sent you except we've sent you to all. Look what Allah said, we sent you to all of the people. But, what well, as a warner and to give glad tidings, but the majority of people don't know. But now you know. Now you know. And I can mention other evidences. Can I conclude, please? Can I? Can I say fadda, 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 fadda. You know, yeah. Just uh, thinking about one thing. Um, 
for a lot of you listening right now, um, we've brought you the evidences, we've brought you the statements of the scholars, how they, you know, understood these evidences. You know, a person who truly actually thinks about the hereafter, the next life, a person who truly thinks about, you know, the promise of Jannah, and then also thinks about the promise of Jahannam for those who disobeyed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Only fear can enter your heart for you to now stay away from matters like these. The evidence is so clear. And if a person truly understands what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran about Jahannam, and I, I don't know how you can even try and argue such things. Like, for example, uh, in Surah Al Naba, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, in Jahannam kanat mirsada. Truly, hellfire is a place of ambush. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala goes on and says, لِلْطَاغِينَ مَآبَ For those who, you know, transgress the limits of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, those sinners, free mixing is a sin. And now, you, after we've brought you the evidences, you still want to go and, and commit such filthy acts. And then look what Allah says after. Truly you would you know, stay there for ages For a long time So A person who truly understands the promise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala This Quran, this Mus'haf that was you know, given to us The Quran, the Kitab of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala In which we have 100% certainty in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells you this And still yet you want to go and commit such filthy acts you want to make excuses and try and make the deen watered down and come and say that we've made the deen hard. Wallahi, I just ask you by Allah, just think about the punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then also think about the promise that Allah has given you of Jannah. For those believers that understood it would be hard, understood there would be trials and tribulations. But still because they wanted to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they stayed away from these things. Wallahi, if only a person just pondered. So just to uh, conclude and end, um, you know, no. one thing that just came to my mind, let me just try to just mention that, obviously, you know, there might be some of you watching this who, it does, you know, it, from what you said, it, it might make sense to you, but in your heart, it's just a bit like, well, this, that seems a bit too, a bit too much, it's a bit too extreme, and how would you mean, like, I've got, I've got to school, I've got college, I have friends who are, you know, Muslim, and, you know, you might think, well, look, we're, we're living in, in the West, and, you know, we need to integrate all this and that, but why like, Islam didn't come? to you know for us to come and you know integrate and you know be with them be like them and whatnot it's it, the prophet made it very very clear that you know that you will be like strangers don't get it twisted if you decide to follow the path of the prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam you will be a stranger just like he was a stranger amongst the Quraysh they abused him they heckled him they you know they did mental abuse physical abuse everything they could they threw it at him but he stayed firm upon that and the companions stayed firm upon that they stayed with him you know, and it's sad today, you know, you know we shy away from the sunnah. It was interesting about that as well, is that a lot of people come and say, oh, brother, you lot, your da'wah, it separates the people, you know, free mixing, this, that, you know, you're just making it hard for us to integrate with the people and whatnot. And, you know, Sheikh al-Albani was asked this question, yeah, and he said, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, one of his name was the divider. Subhanallah. One of the names of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was the divider. Farqun bayn al-Nas, they used to say. So, subhanAllah, the Quran is called Al Furqan, the divider. They used to call Umar al Al-Furuq. Al Furuq. The Prophet gave that name because Furuq means you divide the haq from the batil. So, you know. Just, go on, go on. Sorry, can I just. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Just to agree, because I know Bakr wants me to stop talking. No, no, no. I was going to make my point, brother. No, father, father, father. No, so yes, I was going to say this. Obviously, just remember, innit? We're not here to please anyone other than Allah. We're not here to, you know. To be, you know, like, like I mentioned, to integrate and all this and that. And it's just sad because nowadays you see so many people they come, they water down the religion as much as they can in an attempt to, you know, satisfy and, you know, meet the needs of, of other people. And that isn't the case. Well, like, that's not the case whatsoever. And the Prophet said in the hadith, فَعَلَيْكُمْ بِسُنَّةِ Upon you is my sunnah. وَسُنَّةِ الْخُلَفَاءَ رَشِدِينَ وَمَحْدِينَ And the sunnah of the four khulafa, عَدُّ عَلَيْهَا بِالنَّوَاجِدِ Hold on to it with your mola teeth. And today, we live in a day in a society where you have to hold on to it with morality. And if you do, it, it's, it's very difficult. It's very difficult. It's very easy when, you know, you go for a job interview and almost sticks out of hand and you have, to, you know, brothers going to be like, oh, 
can't do that. Awesome I, I, I need they the job. Come with good ideas and they just yeah, we, some of us we, we <laughs> have to think out. of creative ways to prevent them from touching our hand. You know, <laughs> <laughs> we'll have that on another show. <laughs> okay, no the, problem, the tone no. is quite serious. It's going to become. We'll have that on another show. It's basically it's hands like flying. And when that feels, we just tell them direct this in. Don't touch my hand. <laughs> In a nice but, um, way. So yeah, so the point stands, and like I said, the Prophet said that we will be like strangers. Islam began as something strange, it will go back to being strangers as it began. Give glad tidings to the strangers. Allah, we're not saying it's easy. We're not saying it's easy. But if you know that Allah is with you, Allah, everything becomes easy. It becomes easy for you. So um, I'll leave it with Imran to drop the last point. I uh, know he's, you know. Yeah, because you know what it is, brothers and sisters? This is what it comes to. Aqidah is, like, you have to understand, brothers and sisters. At the end of the day, yeah. Uh, why are we so passionate about this topic? It's not as simple as a boy. Like we see, you might be like, there's many women in the clubs. Why are you not more angry about that? At least these guys are in an Islamic environment, yeah. You know why, brothers and sisters? Because it's a bit deeper than just a sin. For these people who try to push this and say free mixing is permissible, and they happen to be people who say I'm, I'm a da'i, I do that, or I'm a sheikh, I'm an Islamic speaker, it's my Islamic project, blah blah blah. It's because they are actually. Doing something deeper than just sinning, they're doing something called bid'ah. They are changing the religion. And why are they doing this? I have with me a book right here, and this is a refutation on a man called Rashid al Ghunushi. Okay, Rashid al Ghunushi. Rashid al Ghunushi is an individual from Ikhwan al Muslimin. Ikhwan al Muslimin is a sect. A lot of people do not understand this group. It's sad because this, even a lot of ulama at the beginning were confused. Because these people, they, 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 they tell you, oh, look, I'm a Salafi in my Aqidah. They tell you, look, I believe in Allah's even attributes. I believe Iman goes up and down. They will say all these statements too that will make you think they are upon the path of the Salaf. But there's a, but there's a very subtle uh, corruption in the Aqidah that takes a person with a bit of a deep look to identify and bring it out. And basically what they believe is this. Because you'll see their women might wear niqab. You'll see them have trials above their ankle, some of them. You'll see them grow beards. They look like you, but they're not. They are a hidden sect. And what is it that they believe? One of the fundamental things that they believe is that our da'wah should spread by any means necessary. The da'wah. ends justify the means. The ends justify the means. Okay, it's a very Machiavellian principle. Okay, the ends justify the means. So what that means is, we are doing a show. We want sisters to watch and brothers to watch. And sisters are probably the ones who watch the most TV. So let's bring some women on the TV screen. Let them sit in front of the men. Is that haram, akhi? No. But will it bring more views? No. So for them, the ends justify the means. But rather, what we believe is that the deen is about quality over quantity. Allah said, when He created death, life and death, why? لِيَبَلُوَكُمْ أَيُّكُمْ أَحْسَنُ amala To test who has got the most quality in his actions, not the most quantity. And what is quality? فُضَيْلَ ibn Adam rahimahullah said, أَخْلَصُهُ The one who has the most sincerity in his action وَأَصْوَبُهُ The one who has the most sunnah in his actions so. The one who's most You have these two act, things make quality Sincerity So they might have sincerity They Oh I'm doing it for the sake of Allah I'm bringing men and women together Right? But they are they have they fell short on the second part, which is to obey the messenger Ali Sassam in this mm-hmm. And they do that a lot They will say Oh we do protesting Men and women come together Blah 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 Why? Ends justify the means for them. Do you see what I'm saying? But what we believe is we say, no, look, even if only 10 people watch, it's the quality over the quantity. The Sahaba radiallahu anhum, ajma'in, were just a handful of people, but Allah gave them victory of what, akhi? Allah gave them Rome. Allah gave them Persia. Allah gave them Africa. From footsteps of China in the east to the shores of Spain in the west. Because they obeyed Allah in these two things. Do you see what I'm saying? But this sect, they don't believe that. They believe ends justify the means. Okay, that's why this person is. Okay, they, they've got filthy fatwas. They will tell you, listen, bro. The fatwas that they come out with are filthy. These people, this sect, the ones who have been refuted. They will tell you, listen, bro. You work with a woman, right? It's haram for that you and that woman to work together, right? Because you're Freemason. You know what you do? Take her to the side, and basically tell her to take her top off and remove her bra, and you can drink her breast milk. And you drink her breast milk, you're like a son now. She's like, she's, you're a grown man. You're a grown man. I yeah, you're, 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 you're drinking her breast milk from her. So that, that's the kind of things that these people come up with. And you know what is sad, brothers and sisters, is that in the UK, these things, the scholars have been talking about it for years, for decades in the Middle East. Yeah, but this stuff spreads over from the Middle East to the West very slowly. So you're hearing about this from long, like, rah, that's dirty. I'm telling you, I heard this stuff years ago. 
because the ulama were refuting this years ago. And it's not going to be long till these dons here in the UK or in the USA come and say the same thing. You can take off, you know, oh, oh yeah. you're in school? Girls, just take off your tops and, you know, you become the milk mothers of these boys. And no problem, you can work together. It's like even with ISIS, the scholars in... The, the rule number yeah, of time ago for, they said for it. Over, for six months before we knew it here, seven before months before people it, even like people here were still saying, No, oh, you know, it's, it's a legitimate, it's this, yeah. it's that people you know, inclined towards yeah. that, you, even though you know, now they may deny it. Back then, the scholars had already spoken, had said, We've seen them spoken about it we, because, because they had, because, like I said, like we said, we always go back to the scholars. The scholars are the ones who know this religion better than any of us. And like I said, Ustad Abdurrahman used to always say, In Baran, Wallahi, I don't want to mention names right now. But there are certain people in the da'wah who are quite big in the West. He told me, he said, Imran, this person, watch, in a few months he's going to say this. Then he said, after that he's going to say this and his belief is going to get to here. To the point where he's going to come with kufriya to watch it. Imran. He said, wallahi. And the people will follow. And, uh, and he said the people will follow. Him. But I was like, Stad, come on, like, like, it's not some Nostradamus thing. You know what I'm saying? What the, hell's that? the guy who predicted the future. You know what I'm saying? He said, you don't understand. I'm not predicting our future. This this man in the West here, I don't want to say names. Okay? His equivalent is in the he, No, he said he ta- he's studying from him. He's got pictures on Facebook with these guys. But you'll think he's a sheikh. You'll think he don't. He said he, he's taking from him. I can see the books that he's reading from which he's sh- sharing this filth with the people. And wallahi, he said the same thing. And to the point where the person came out with even bigger kufri at Ustad said, wallahi, this I'm shocked. And they all follow suit. Yeah. So that's why you guys have to understand, I beg you, it seems boring, it seems weird. Ahlul Sunnati wa Jama'a like that, they're like the strangers, they seem strict, it's better you protect your religion, you're listening to these people, they'll corrupt your aqeedah. These are the same people that will tell you vote, okay? The same t- ch- uh, you know, uh, channels and projects and whatnot, they'll tell you vote. They'll bring MPs on and, A'udhu Billah. You know, and we're going to discuss voting, so I don't want to talk about it much now. But can I just mention, these same people who are going to tell you vote, yeah, and they're all about politics, 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 politics. They want to do free mixing. What did Ibn Qayyim say? That when free mixing enters a nation, it destroys the nation. What destroyed Spain? Free mixing. Yet yeah, these people who are telling you vote, who talk to you about Islamic politics and tell you politics back home and politics here, they want political power, yet they want to free mix at the same time. So we'll leave it there inshallah ta'ala. Hopefully bro, this is those of you who asked this question, hopefully your question has been answered. Uh, people are asking for evidence, alhamdulillah, we bought the evidence, people are asking for scholars, we bought the scholars inshallah ta'ala. Again, none of this is from us, we're just conveying to you what the scholars have said. Um, you know, and like Brother Imran was saying, please, well like bro, this is a study your religion. Why study your religion? The fact that if you're watching this and you made it this far into this video, I mean given today's set of people can't there's, within 10 minutes the, minutes Within 10 minutes The you know, attention span goes MashaAllah That's an achievement In, in and within itself uh, Even actually They can you know, go to Muslim Survival Guide Which is an online mm-hmm. Islamic studies program That we have And they can study it For free right now They can access For the first month Fasting For free the first course. Yeah Well we've got Many courses on there Islamic studies courses And we try to put A new one out every month But right now We've got the fasting one That's just come Because Ramadan is around the corner Actually you can have access For free Just go to the link below Leave your email address. Marriage and courses, etc. All, all of the marriage the courses. He's got a tafsir course coming out. Another tafsir course in the last 10 days of Ramadan. So, inshallah, so, I'll show it al Fatiha and whatnot. So, it'll be good. Maybe go to a link, check it out. Make the, it free because it's Ramadan and stuff. The point is, regardless of which, make sure you study. And make sure you study the correct knowledge according to the Quran and the Sunnah. Sorry, according to the Quran and the Sunnah, according to the understanding of the Salaf. And finally, before we end, I mentioned you know, Brother Imran mentioned quality over quantity. So shout out to Khalid Green, man. Mashallah, that guy puts out quality. quality. Even though he doesn't get views, if you guys don't know about Khalid Green, get to know. Inshallah, until next time. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Pow. Oh,